on, on behalf of the Department of Mathematics at Princeton University, it's, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone here for this year's Minerva Lecture Series that will be presented by Professor Hugo Duminiel Copin. And in a moment, Professor Xiaobo Zhang will, will, will make a, a formal introduction, but I'd like to take this opportunity to say a few words about uh, the Minerva Lectures and Minerva Foundation. So uh, the Minerva Lectures are, have been so very generously endowed by the, the Minerva Foundation, and, and the Minerva Foundation has furthermore been sort of extremely generous towards the Princeton University Mathematics Department over sort of m many years. And the director of the, the foundation is uh, Louisa Fernholtz, who's also a member of the department's advisory council. So, so this year's lectures are the, the tenth lecture series in the series, and uh, which dates back to 2012, where the first series of lectures were given by uh, Jean-Pierre Serre from the College de France. So, it's my pleasure to introduce. Professor Xiao Zhang who will introduce our speaker. Okay. Thank you. See, this is a really special thing. We need two speakers to introduce. I like it. It's unusual. You know that Fine Hall is a very tall building. It's very quiet from the top. Then if you want an active thing, you come to the third floor. If you really, really can, really active thing, this is the, the largest event of the department. So we put in the basement because this is really the most important part. So every year we will annually pick up, uh, uh, pick, carefully pick up a, a, a lecture, a so-called uh, MINOVA Distinguished Lecture Series. And uh, as David said, this is the 10th year. And uh, typically we propose many people on Blackboard and we vote. So it's very seriously uh, business in the department. OK, this year is my Great pleasure uh, to introduce Hugo Domini Kupen from um, ICS and also University of Geneva. Um, Hugo studied his mathematics in college in Paris, um, but he got his PhD in Geneva in 2012 um, and uh, Smirnov. And uh, since then, he, every year he gets some prize. And uh, I just read the recent three prizes he got. In 2016, he got uh, this uh, prize of European Mathematics Society, uh, arguably the best prize for younger people, and uh, 35 or 32, 35. Then, 2017, he received New Horizon Prize um, of Mathematics, and also there's a Lover uh, Prize. And last year, he was an uh, uh, ICM uh, lecturer. And, uh, and, and Hugo is a probabilist, and he's uh, more focused on statistics models, and, uh, but his work has uh, impact mathematical physics in complex analysis, combinatorics, and also in statistical physics. And uh, today, we have three lectures. Today is a five to six. Tomorrow, five to six, then Friday is a two o'clock, two to three. So it's my great pleasure to, for this first lecture, the title of the content, Self-Avoiding Works from Combinatorics of Physics. At the end, you have to tell us something good about the square root of 2 plus square root of 2. <laughs> well, yeah, this is a... Thank you very much for the, the nice introduction and the spoiler also on, on the square root 2 plus square root 2. But. Okay, so the, the three lectures will be kind of independent. So if you miss, well, you didn't miss the first one, obviously, but um, if you miss the second one, you can clearly uh, follow the third one. And the idea of this first lecture is both to tell you about a model that I like very much, but also to illustrate the notions that will come back in the two next lectures. So they are independent lectures, but they are discussing things that are interconnected, so today I think it's, I mean, the good thing with self-avoiding work is that it's maybe the simplest model in which you can really 
talk about these notions, and uh, I, I want to do that uh, carefully. Okay, so before everything, let me start by the definition of the model, like that we are all on the same page. So, the self avoiding walk is a model of polymer. You should think of a long chain of, of monomers, and uh, these monomers, they will live on a lattice, L, so it's just a transitive, infinite, locally finite graph. Think of Z2 or ZD, for example, it could be, uh, ZD could be the hexagonal lattice, which we will indeed see, it could be a tree, it could be whatever uh, transitive graph you want. And on this graph, you will uh, select one vertex that you call the origin. And then you look at path starting from the origin. So a walk will simply be an arbitrary uh, sequence, gamma zero equals zero, gamma one, gamma n, a finite sequence, n will be the length. And it's a walk if it just goes from, na from uh, neighbor to neighbor, so satisfying the following thing, satisfying that gamma i, gamma i plus one is always an edge of your lattice, okay? That's the notion of walk. And it's gonna be safe avoiding if it just never comes back to the same vertex, okay? So it's safe avoiding if gamma i is not equal to gamma j for any i not equal to j. So up to now, I hope I lost nobody. And just for notations, uh, I will call safe avoiding walk n just a set of safe avoiding walk of length n. Again, I mean, they all start from zero. Huh? And Cn would just be the cardinality of this set. You are going to see we are going to work a lot with these things. Okay, so again, it was introduced first uh, as a model for polymers. So one particular thing is that it was not introduced by mathematicians. Uh, it was introduced in 47 by Orr and you know, it's always like at the same time, but not really by uh, uh, Paul Flory, who is a Nobel Prize in uh, chemistry. And again, the, you are gonna see the intuition is that you want to think of this long chain here as a chain of polymers, and the only constraint, it's kind of an ideal polymer in the sense that the only constraint you are fixing on it is that the monomers obviously are not at the same place, right? Okay. So what are the questions that you could wish to answer on this model? So if you think of it as a model coming from combinatorics, the most natural question is just to try to enumerate these objects, and in particular to try to count to count them, so to, I mean, to determine CN, okay? I mean, maybe determining exactly is, is something difficult, but can we approximate? Can we understand how it grows and things like that? So that's kind of the question that would come from a combinatorics motivation. Of course, you can also do a little bit differently, I mean, see your model differently and think of, okay, I don't care so much how many walks of length n there are, but maybe I want to look at how typically they are. So if I pick a walk at random amongst walks of length n, what is the behavior? How big is it? Like what is the radius, for instance? Uh, what is, uh, I mean, maybe the house of dimension? Can we estimate things like that? I mean, does it come back to, I mean, close to zero very often? Things like that. So, uh, I mean, typical behavior. of gamma in my set. Maybe actually I should have drawn it for you. And here, maybe the most natural way of, uh, of, uh, of doing that is to decide that you are gonna pick one of these walks at random, uniformly, so the probability of each walk would be one over Cn, 
And now you have a random object and you can start to do probability on it. You can look at the expected distance to the origin for the endpoint. You can look at, you know, things like that. There is a third question, so this is really like combinatorics. This would be more like probability. And there is an, a third question that comes really more from the original motivation, which is, for instance, Flory as a chemist, I mean, he's interested in, in the, just the behavior of this works in a solvent. And in particular, for instance, if you imagine a DNA chain, which is a honest uh, mono, I mean, polymer, I mean, if you want to decode it, for instance, maybe you prefer that it's extended rather than just uh, wrap uh, upon itself. So his idea was to try to see this model as a model st from statistical physics depending on the property of a solvent. And in particular, what they, he wanted to see is whether there is a phase transition in this model. And this maybe, for now, I don't tell you too much uh, what that means, but I want to explain it in the middle of the talk. So can we think of safe avoiding work as a model, I mean, undergoing a phase transition. And I will tell you what a phase transition is and how we can see safe avoiding work as a model undergoing a phase transition. And this is, for instance, one of the things that I want to insist on because tomorrow and after tomorrow we will discuss phase transition, but for another model, not the model of safe avoiding work. Okay. So these are the three questions. Now, what are the answers? So it's, it's simple to ask questions, but in the case of safe avoiding work, it's not so easy to answer them. So let's start by the first question about the combinatorial aspects of the model. So, First thing is like if you are already bored, I mean something you can try is to count the forwarding work, say on Z2. And if you are motivated, you are gonna see the first numbers are not that complicated to compute. But pretty quickly you reach a level where well it starts to be difficult to count because this number C N is growing very fast. And in fact, in the best, I mean, there are people who really love counting safe avoiding walks, and they uh, build algorithm to compute these safe avoiding walks. And the best, I mean, uh, currently known result is so 71 or 79. I don't remember. I don't know that by heart. 79. Yeah, it's not. This is not the best one, obviously, but this one is. And it's something like uh, one point and blah, blah, and uh, times t to the 34, 10 to the 34. They have the exact number, but I'm not going to spell the 34 uh, digits. Just, so this is a result which is due to Jensen. It's a very recent result. And, and really imagine that he's using like thousands of hours of computer time and not so stupid uh, algorithm. In fact, if you do in, a, in the most brutal way, if you try to count the forwarding work on the square lattice, the complexity of your algorithm is actually going to grow like 2.74 to the n. It grows exponentially. And uh, I think Jensen's algorithm is growing like 1.1 to the n or something like that, which is already much, much better. But it's still exponential. It's terrible. And C79 is, uh, is the best number they, they know. One key point of, of, uh, of the safe holding work uh, counting problem, which, which uh, emerged very quickly when you try, is that the information on C79 is giving you basically no information on C80. For people who know, the safe holding work are kind of the farthest you can imagine from a Markov process. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to know how you are going to extend by one step safe avoiding works because many of the works of length 79 just cannot be extended, all those that end in a, in a dead end. The problem, so then you are, maybe you could think, okay, but maybe I could encode, I could count those that finish at the same place on one side and then the other ones I can extend them. 
Yeah, but I mean, very quickly you realize that those that uh, arrive at distance two of a place which is really bad and probably will get blocked, you should also remove them and so on and so on. And of course, after very little uh, thinking, you realize, well, I really need to encode the whole walk. So I have really the farthest you can imagine from a Markov process. And in particular, that will mean that it's very, very unlikely that I will manage to get a recursion on CN, for instance, or things like that. I will come back to that later when we will discuss uh, the, the square lattice, the hexagonal lattice, sorry. So very quickly, even if you plug the 79 uh, first uh, terms in a sequence recognizing program or anything, you just end up with no formula. It just looks like computing exactly CN is probably uh, uh, a dead end. Okay, but I mean, uh, we are mathematicians, so we don't need to compute exactly. We can also just do asymptotics. And the first thing, the first uh, lemma I want to uh, discuss, it will be the, the only full proof, and it's going to be a very simple proof, is a lemma by Hammersley. And the lemma is telling you, well, okay, I cannot compute CN, but what I can do is I can prove that Cn to the one over n converges to a constant. So it converges to a constant that I would, could mu, would call mu c of the lattice. It depends on the lattice. And this is called the, the connective constant. And the proof is as simple as it gets, which is always nice. But I like to do it because it's actually a proof that, that, I mean, it's a tool that is used pretty often actually in statistical physics. So the idea is very simple. We are just going to use submultiplicativity. Why? Because if I take a walk of length n plus k and I cut it after n steps, I end up with one walk of length n and the translate of a walk of length k. So cn plus k is necessarily smaller or equal to Cn times Ck, okay? And that automatically tells you by Fekete's lemma, or I mean, I don't know whether we should give a name to this type of trivialities, but this converges to the infimum of the Ck to the one over k. And this is the end of the proof. So it's really, for once, it's a one-line proof which actually fits on a normal, uh, normal board, so. But it's a very useful one because now, we have this connective constant, and the natural question is, can we compute it? Okay. Okay, let's start easy. If you can start on, uh, on, uh, on Z, that's, uh, this one actually is, uh, is pretty simple. You get one, of course. If you look, say, on a DRE tree, so a tree of degree uh, D plus one, then, well, the first step, you have d plus one choices, and then you cannot backtrack, and this is the only condition that you have, so it's easy to see that the number of walks of length n is d plus one times d to the n minus one, so the connective constant is d. So all of this is simple. If I give you the ladder, like that, which is a honest transitive graph, what is the connective constant? Well, there, I let you think if, if you want me to go faster and you realize I'm not doing it, then you can try to prove that. It's the golden ratio. But the key of these three cases, why do I mention these three cases? Well, basically because they are the only cases where we know and that they share a very uh, bad uh, property in some sense which is that in these cases, you can actually compute explicitly CN. These are trivial cases, so there you can really compute them. But then, as soon as you try other lattices, you end up a little bit uh, in, a, in a bush, in the sense that if you look at Z2, for instance, you can approximate, for instance, I know C79 and I know that Cn to the one over n is larger or equal to mu C by this property. So I get an upper bound on mu C of the lattice. I can get lower bounds as well, like rigorous ones. 
And this is basically the 2.73, etc., that I mentioned earlier in the complexity of the algorithm. On the square lattice, it grows roughly like 2.73 to the end, but the exact formula is complex. Seven, eight, six. Uh, I, uh, I, I mean six. I mean, okay, sorry about that. 2.63. Uh, and... Uh, and it's an approx approximation, but it doesn't seem to be corresponding to any uh, nice number, and definitely we have no clue on a closed formula for this one. Okay. This was uh, the story basically up to uh, 1980, where Ninhaus, who is a, a, a brilliant physicist, interested in something completely different, like... Uh, uh, exactly solvable uh, statistical physics model. Uh, Ninhaus in AT conjectures the following thing. He said, well, there is another lattice on which I can tell uh, the connective constant. It is the hexagonal lattice. And in this case, it should be equal to square root of 2 plus connective. Which is really like it's, a, it's an island in the middle of a huge sea. Like I, I, personally, I don't really believe that there are other lattices. I mean, there are some lattices that you can get from this one in a trivial fashion, but it's really an isolated case where you can compute explicitly the connective constant and it has its nice uh, algebraic formula. So towards the end of, uh, of, the, of the talk, I will tell you a little bit about the proof. So this is uh, a result that we obtained with uh, Stas Smirnov in 2012. And it's indeed uh, well, um, what is written there. And surprisingly, at least for us, it was surprising. The proof is very, very, very short. It's like 10 pages from, uh, uh, yeah, not even 10 pages if you want uh, the reader to... Uh, sweat a little bit, but, uh, and I will tell you what is the gist, what, what is the idea behind it at the end of the talk. But before that, I want to keep going in, um, I mean, tell you a little bit more generalities about self forwarding works, because really I think that it's going to illustrate very well uh, what I will discuss uh, in the next lectures, and also because it's always nice to make people wait a little bit, so if I give you right away the proof, it's not possible. Okay, so let me talk, tell you about one of the things that makes this model uh, such a beautiful uh, object. It's a conjecture, and the conjecture is the following. So, okay, for instance, on the hexagonal lattice, I tell you mu c is square root of 2 plus square root of 2, so that tells you that cn is mu c, so square root of 2 plus square root of 2, to the n plus little o of n, right? But this is a very rough information on... Uh, on CN, so the natural question is to ask what are the other terms in the expansion. And the conjecture is that CN should behave, should be equivalent to a constant that will depend on your lattice and to a certain constant G times mu C of your lattice to the N. And here I'm not saying square lattice, okay? I'm saying a lattice. And the interesting aspect is that these two constants, they depend on the lattice very uh, strongly, but G doesn't. G should be equal to zero if you take a one-dimensional lattice, a lattice with linear growth. It should be equal to uh, zero if you take a lattice which are more than uh, dimension four growth. Here I should be a little bit careful. This equivalent is not uh, true. Uh, so this is, uh, I mean, with logarithmic correction in dimension four. But I mean, this is just uh, that, you know, people who know don't uh, jump at, uh, at me at the end of the talk saying that I said uh, stupid things for the whole talk. But the inter, I mean, constant which is zero always is not so nice, but what is nice is that in dimension two, it should be equal to 11 over 32, like I'm pretty sure most of you already guessed. So this is true, and 
you see, the beauty of the prediction is that this is true for any, this should be true for any planar lattice. So if you take the hexagonal lattice, you roughly have square root of 2 plus square root of 2 to the n walks, but the correction to, to it is n to the 11 over 32. Very good. Now take the square lattice. The square lattice has 2.73 to the n walks. So like the, the exponential number of walks is completely different. There is, like it's absolutely not comparable where the correction in front of the, uh, of the exponential term is exactly the same. So that's what we call a universal exponent. So there are two important things here. There is a notion of universality. It's universal among all lattices that are planar. And the second thing is that this is called a critical exponent. That's two notions that that I will rediscuss in, in next uh, lectures. Just for culture in dimension three, you see, it, it, it's the whole story of statistical physics, like large dimensions are fairly simple because in fact, the, the behavior is, is close to what we call mean field behavior. Dimension two is, uh, is, uh, is uh, very well understood because we can thank people that work in Princeton and. Uh, I mean, physicists that develop the whole theory of conformal field theory, which basically gives you predictions for this. Unfortunately, you see, I mean, physicists became a little bit lazy, so in dimension three, they have difficulties having a good uh, theory for uh, critical phenomena. So in dimension three, the best which are known are like approximations of the exponents, and we don't have closed formula, and maybe actually, I would guess there is none. Like it's a certain number, and it's roughly 0 0.15. But again, it should not depend on the lattice. Okay, it's good to have conjectures. Let me tell you what is the best known to realize, to make you realize that there is room for, uh, for new ideas. So, the best known, so this is a remark. Well, Hammersley and Welsh, They proved, so I think it's 52, no, 52 was maybe the other one, so 62. They proved the following bond. So we already know that Cn is larger or equal to mu C to the n, right? Well, on the other side, the best we know is e to the square root n. So we are very, very far from having polynomial bonds, for instance. Even worse than that, Nobody knows how to improve this in dimension three and two. In dimension uh, four, it's not improvable, right? It's the right order of magnitude. But in dimension three and two, we don't know how to improve that. And here, the best improvement we got is e to the n to the one half minus epsilon. And this is a very recent result uh, by myself and, and co-authors, but um, I'm not gonna uh, discuss this further, but it had to wait for 50 years to get really the tiniest uh, improvement you can imagine on, uh, on this. I, I should say in dimension three, they are, uh, I mean, square root n can be improved, but let's say in dimension two, for instance. So open question, try to improve better. And in particular, I think the, the very big step would be to prove that Cn is smaller than n to a certain constant times mu c to the n. Because this would be uh, kind of saying that there is critical behavior. So this, uh, this polynomial bound would be a very, very nice uh, result. Okay, so that was the combinatorial uh, side. Let me ma now tell you a little bit about the geometry. So the geometry of the random object. So in some sense, in the combinatorics, we started from our computation and we went farther. There, uh, so the geometry of large walks, this goes back to Flory. Because Flory, in, in his original paper, was interested in the following quantity. So take gamma n to be the random walk 
random self-forwarding work, which is just uniformly chosen in this set. Okay, you just pick one uniformly at random. And Flory predicted the following. He said, okay, uh, Mn, which is gonna be the mean diameter. So you take gamma N, you take its mean diameter. So the average of the diameter. I mean, it's for people who don't like probability, first you are wrong. And second, it's, uh, <laughs> this is a fancy way of just saying uh, this thing. Okay, just that. Maybe I'm not advocating very well, I mean, defending very well probability uh, in that. Maybe that was actually even shorter than that. But anyway, this quantity, Flory predicted that in dimension two, well, actually, let's not restrict it to Flory. So the conjecture is that Mn should behave like N to the new. New is equivalent of a G there in the sense that new is gonna depend on the dimension of my lattice. In dimension one, new is gonna be equal to one. In that large dimension is gonna be equal to one half, and I will come back to that later. Again, there are logarithmic corrections. Again, in 3D, it's equal to something, I don't remember what. But the beautiful thing is that Flory predicted that in 2D, it's equal to three fourths. And this is beautiful because, you know, you need to be very smart to do a right prediction, but you need to be even smarter to do a right prediction out of two mistakes. And that's exactly what Flory did. So Flory predicted two things, I mean, used two things to predict this. He basically said, I mean, this is gonna be two buzzwords, I can discuss it more at the end if you want, but he predicted mean field behavior of the safe holding work, which doesn't happen in dimension two. And he used it, he combined it with the Gaussian behavior of the radius, which is also wrong. But when you combine the two, you get uh, three fourths. And there are not so many numbers anyway. I mean, there are many numbers, but <laughs> uh, like simple numbers between one half and one. And uh, if you think uh, one half and one are the two natural bounds, right, for the diameters, you cannot go farther than distance n. And you clearly, by just the fact that you are self avoiding, have at least diameter n to the one half. So three fourths was maybe the next in line, but um, the beautiful thing is that that's the truth. It is indeed the truth. And I want just to tell you now how one can predict this uh, three fourths without making two mistakes. And um, that this prediction in some sense tell you why it should be universal. This, uh, this G and this new. Just before that, uh, the one half, so the D equal four, I mean, actually D is strictly larger than four, you get one half. And this should already tell you, oh, there is something simpler happening there because what is an object, a random object, a random walk object that typically gets to distance square root 10 in n steps? Well, the simple random walks, which exactly consists in picking uniformly a work of length n without the self repellence this guy gets to distance square root n. So what we are saying is that in dimension larger than four, the self avoiding walk behaves like the random walk. Okay, this is absolutely not a simple thing to do, to prove, but it is true. So for self avoiding walk, it's a result which is due to Hara and Slade. And actually this build on beautiful work by Bridges and Spencer for a very closely related model, which is called weakly safe holding work. So large dimension, things are known. Three dimension, things are definitely out of reach. And two dimensions, I want to tell you a little bit why you should get, um, why you should get, uh, I mean, you, you, you should be able to predict at this right. Okay, so this is the fourth step. 
uh, where universality comes from. Okay, so there is, let, let's start with another example, which is exactly the, the example of simple random walk. So, gamma random walk n would just be a uniformly chosen path of length n. And this is a very, very classical object, much simpler to study because it's a Markov process. And in particular, it's known for a very long time. It's a theorem due to Donsker. I think uh, 51. Okay. That says the following. If I take my random walk of length n, and I see it as a path, as a function on zero one. So I could, for instance, travel along it at speed uh, n. And like that, this gives me a path index, I mean a function from zero one to the space. And if I rescale it by one over n to the one half, well, this function, it's a random function, right? But I can prove that it converges what we call in law, so as, as a random object, if you want, to a continuous random function called the Brownian motion. So, I mean, if you never heard about the Brownian motion, Google it now, that's what you should say. And the important feature here is that you can ask this on the square lattice, you can ask this on the hexagonal lattice, triangular lattice, etc., etc. You always converge to the same object, this Brownian motion. So if you want the large scale behavior of your object, of your walks, is always the same. It's always looking like Brownian motion. Okay. Well, when you take a self-avoiding walk, first thing, if you want to have, so if I take now self-avoiding walk, and I want to have a scaling limit, first thing, if I believe Flory, which is something, uh, well, you should do, maybe. Well, first thing, if I want to rescale it, I definitely want to rescale it by three-fourths to have everything happening in a bounded region. And the thing is that you have convergence of this object to a continuum object, but this continuum object is not the Brownian motion, it's what we call a schramm lovner evolution. And at this stage, I just put it with quotes because it's not exactly, it doesn't exactly make sense as, a, as I, write, I wrote it. I will tell you a little bit more about the true conjecture in a minute. But the important thing that I want you to remember here is that you have, and this is of course not from Danskers, and it's not a theorem where there are many things that are, <laughs> and this is not Brownian motion. It should be in low, so at least we have one thing right. Um, but what I want you to remember from this, uh, I don't want to call it a statement or a conjecture, I, well, this, these things, is that when you rescale properly, you should always converge to the same object, okay? And this is something natural to predict in physics. Now, so this is going to be, in some, uh, some sense, my black box. I don't want to discuss why this should be true, why the large scale properties of a model should be basically independent of the model. But if you think about it, it better be because, I mean, in nature, no model, like no, no polymer is actually living on the hexagonal lattice, right? I mean, actually the hexagonal lattice may be the exception with graphene, but I mean, you no, know, things are not living on lattices, so if you want that the mathematical study of this object makes sense physically, you better have some kind of independence in the like, way you define it, right? But what I want to, to, to explain is why nu and g should be universal, why mu c is not, right? I mean, there is like, there are, they play different roles, and I want to, to explain to you why in fact, it's, it's natural to conjecture that this is not universal, but G and U are. So first, uh, first thing, so remark one, is that, well, if you think about it, 
if you know what this process is, then you kind of, can, you kind of guess what new should be. Okay? Because imagine you have, so this is your SLE, whatever SLE is, and imagine that this SLE has a certain Hausdorff dimension. Okay? So if I take an epsilon, the number of balls I need to cover this guy should be epsilon to the minus dh. Okay? But now if you take a self-holding walk, and if this self-holding walk looks like, uh, like this SLE, then if you think of this walk as doing, you know, steps of size epsilon or size uh, one over n, how many steps does it need to do to get to distance one? Well, it will need to do epsilon to the minus dh steps like that. So if now you rescale the thing and you think of steps of length one and you have exactly n steps, where is the distance you should go? It should be n to the one over dh. Okay, so the Hausdorff dimension tells you that uh, the mean, I mean mn should behave like n to the one over dh. But this SLE, that this mysterious SLE that I am not really defining for you, is really an object that you understand very well. The reason for that is that it has a lot of symmetries, and that's going to be the core of, of, uh, of, uh, of the next uh, chapter of this, uh, maybe I should not call it chapter, but section of this, this talk. It has a lot of symmetries, and objects that have a lot of symmetries are simpler to study. So in particular, you can compute DH, and DH you can prove that it's four-third, and this is a result by Befara. So, as soon as you assume convergence to the right SLE, then you should be able to deduce new, and the key thing I want you to remember is that new is kind of measurable in terms of the continuum limit. If I give you the continuum limit, then there is only one new which is possible, and it is one over dh. Okay, what about, oh, what can, can we just do like that? What about G now? There it's a little bit less clear, but the thing that you can do is, what is the probability that if you take two self-awarding walks at random, gamma n and gamma prime n, what is the probability that they intersect only at zero? Okay. Well, the number of possibilities for each one of these work is Cn, so you get Cn squared. And the, if you want the probability at the top, you want the number of successful tries, and if you take two walks of length n that only intersect at zero, that just gives you a walk of length 2n. So this is exactly equal to this one, right? But now if I plug in my estimate on Cn, what I end up with is I'm gonna get one over A of L. The mu C to the N is exactly gonna cancel, right? Because I would get mu C to the N squared and I would get mu C to the two N. And then the correction, yes? Uh, well, if you if you fix the, the if you fix the middle, it's like fixing the end by translation. You agree that there is yeah because it, there is a lens. You, it's really a one-to-one -one map. I mean, the, you can even think of them as in, like defined up to translation if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here, just the correction is going to enter into the game. You are going to get this two to the g, and you are going to get a n to the g here. Okay. So this probability is going to decay like one over n to this g. But if you believe the analogy with SLE, this should be basically like sampling two SLEs. So SLE uh, and uh, SLE prime. And basically ask, so there it's, I mean, these are continuum objects. So I mean, I mean, at the beginning they can intersect a lot, but you could exactly ask that they don't intersect after size one over n. So the intersection is included 
in the ball of size 1 over n to the 1 over dh, which would correspond, it's the right scaling there. So this should behave like n to the minus alpha over dh, and this alpha here, you can compute it because you can prove that if I put an epsilon here, this should behave like epsilon to the alpha. And this alpha can be computed also from the continuum limit. So again, the g is something measurable in terms of the continuum limit. Hence, it has to be universal. Okay? So every property which is going to depend on the large-scale behavior of your model should be universal. Okay, so these, these were the two first questions. Now let me try to tell you how you can think of, of, uh, of self forwarding work as really a model undergoing a phase transition, and you are going to see that it's also going to allow me to give you a, a more precise conjecture. Yes? So, I mean, the A of L here, I mean, to, from my opinion, even just the existence of the A of L is much less clear, actually, that, uh, that's the thing. And here, you will really, like, uh, um, here, this analogy here is really not up to constant. Yeah, that, that's, um, okay, so, is there another question? No, perfect. Uh, five, so a phase transition in self audio. Okay, so in order to see that, I want really to think of uh, the model depending on a, pa uh, I mean on a solvent somehow, so I want an additional parameter, and in particular, I would like not to fix the length. So I'm going to define now gamma, my self forwarding work thing, except that it's not going to depend on n, but on a parameter x, and it's going to be the following. So imagine you have a room, so a simply connected domain, and you have two points on the boundary of this uh, room, and you want to have a polymer from one point to the other one, okay? So you have omega, you have two points A and B on the boundary, and you want a polymer between the two. Well, what you can do is you can take a very small mesh size, say delta, so think of delta very small, uh, for instance, square lattice or hexagonal lattice, and you can just look at any, so at omega delta, A delta, B delta, which is some kind of approximation of omega A, B on this lattice, and look at a random path, gamma, which will be sampled according to the following. So the probability of gamma will be proportional to x to the length of gamma. Okay? So you do not fix the length, but you penalize the length. So you have a finite number of walks from A, to B, from A delta to B delta in omega delta, so this is a perfectly well-defined object, right? You just renormalize, uh, you can renormalize it in a probability measure, and it gives you a random walk, a, a random self holding walk. Maybe actually the x is not such a, let's rather think of omega delta, a delta, b delta, right, and x. So you have a random object, and you can try to look at the behavior of this random object when delta tends to zero, okay? So for, uh, to simplify, maybe now I would just think of gamma delta, and what you can easily f see is that if x is very small, so if you penalize a lot on the length, what would you end up with? Well, your walk typically is going to go straight from A to B. It's going to go through the geodesic between the two. So if x is uh, too small, then gamma, gamma delta is going to converge in low to a straight line on the contrary if you take x 
very big, then you actually even you can think of rewarding the woke, or at least not penalizing enough its length, what will you end up with? You will end up with a space, a random space filling curve, almost space filling in some sense. Okay? So then gamma delta will converge in low to a space filling curve. Now, if I'm telling you, well, trust me, there is only one point which doesn't fall in these two behavior, then what is the natural guess for this point? Well, it's going to be exactly one over the connective constant. So in fact, here, this behavior is going to be true for any x smaller than 1 over mu c. And this is going to be true for every x larger than 1 over mu c. And at mu c, something much more interesting is going to happen, which is a convergence to the essay. So this is a typical example of a phase transition. You have, as you vary continuously this parameter x, you go from one behavior to another behavior. So here in this case, from a geodesic behavior to a space filling behavior. And at the point, so if you take x exactly equal to 1 over mu c, then something even more, so you are what we call at criticality. When x is equal to 1 over mu c, then in fact this gamma delta converges in low to the schramm lovner evolution. of parameter h And this is a conjecture due to Lohler, Schramm, and Werner. So this, this SLEs have been defined by Odette Schramm. And they have, I mean, there is a whole family of SLE. SLE h is only one of them. And these are random curves from A to B in a simply connected domain. Okay, so this SL is, so here I should maybe add something, in omega AB. So really think of a fractal random curve going from A to B in omega. So why did this model, I mean, uh, why is this SL are so important? Because they have a, a crucial property, which is that they are conformally invariant. So the, here is uh, really the, the key point. So SLE 8 third is conformally invariant. And let me maybe tell you what that means. It means that, and, and you can actually think of it just for self avoiding work. If I give you one domain omega and two points on the boundary, A and B, I can construct SLE 8 third by taking self-forwarding walk and taking the limit when delta tends to zero of this gamma delta. But I could also, if I give you another domain, let's say you don't like this one, and you prefer, say, a circle, for instance, so there exists a conformal map that maps omega to the circle and that maps A to phi of A and B to phi of B. And in this new domain, we'll have two ways of constructing a random curve. The first one is I can simply map the SLE that I constructed here to the other guy. Or I can take the forwarding walk in this domain and take the limit. I will get another random curve. Well, conformal invariance means that these two curves, they have the same law. They are the same object. It's completely clear when you do a rotation by 2 pi over 3, because this is, a, a, let's take the hexagonal lattice for a minute. If you take a rotation of 2 pi over 3, obviously, this preserves self avoiding work because it's already a symmetry of the lattice. But what I'm saying is that this is, in fact, true at the limit, when you take the limit first, it's true whatever the rotations, and in fact, it's even true whatever the conformal map. So there is additional symmetry in the limit. And the more symmetries you have, the simpler it is to study the object. The object is encoded by fewer information, 
And that's exactly the reason why these SLEs are so powerful, and in particular, you can compute their uh, house of dimension, you can uh, compute their intersection probabilities, and so on. Okay. Okay, so that was uh, the phase transition uh, part. Let me just finish, finish in, in five minutes by telling you a little bit what is the connection to the theorem that I mentioned. So, how do you, how would you try to prove, so now that's the six, so proof, I mean, okay, obviously I'm not going to prove anything, but uh, of mu c of the hexagonal lattice equals square root of two plus square root of two. So, if you think that when you take the folding work on the hexagonal lattice, you can take a scaling limit and get something conformally invariant, it's maybe not such a big step, I mean, uh, of imagination, a big uh, jump, to think that there are certain functions that, uh, that I can define on my model that are going to be conformal maps in the limit, right? You get conformal invariance, so, I mean, maybe if I define, you know, uh, smartly a function, it should be conformal. Now, at the discrete level, it makes no sense, but maybe I could have a function that is kind of a discrete analog of a conformal map. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to define for you a function and try to argue that this is a discrete analog of a conformal map. And the beautiful thing is that this function, it, it's decent to predict that it's a discrete analog of a conformal map only when you think of x as being equal to 1 over square root of 2 plus square root of 2. So, take your domain omega, and let's allow ourselves a little bit more freedom. Let's think of B, actually let's keep the, think of B as inside, instead of on the boundary. And let's define, so here is you know, the piece of uh, wizardry of, uh, I mean, uh, like uh, the magic trick in some sense. Define F of B as follows. So, I'm going to define it as a sum of every walks, gamma, that goes from A to B, that remain in omega, of x to the length of gamma. Notice that if you take B on the boundary, this was exactly the partition function, the, the renormalization constant here to make this a probability. So here, in some sense, this is a probability measure when B is on the boundary, okay? So if you look at this kind of the generating function of works from A uh, to B in omega, so it's not quite nice enough, but you can modify it a little bit by adding the following. You add a complex numbers, which is E to the I five over eight times the winding, so the winding of the curve is just the total rotation of gamma from A to B. So, I mean, don't burn uh, the witch, okay? I mean, the reason why you introduce that is actually not completely crazy. I mean, this scaffolding work model belongs to a la, oh, that's not a very nice scaffolding work, okay? Uh, belongs to a large class of models and including what we call the easing model, for which this type of observable is extremely natural. It's called the order disorder variable. It's a very natural thing. So it's a generalization, if you want, of order disorder variables. And I, I promise I'm finishing uh, uh, quickly. So what is the nice property of this thing, of this object? Well, CRM, or I mean, actually, we could even call it a lemma at this stage. It's not a very complicated one. Well, if I take a vertex in my uh, domain, so I take a point V here. Oh, sorry, uh, I didn't tell you what B is, right? I mean, I was uh, a little bit uh, fast here. Uh, we are on a lattice, right? So here, for instance, now we are on the hexagonal lattice. And you are going to see just because it's more convenient for us and, and more elegant, think of B as being the middle of an edge. 
So you are looking at walks that start from the middle of an edge and end at the middle of an edge. It's not a big, uh, big uh, step. So if I take a vertex inside, I have three middle of edges around. And the property is that if x is equal to one of the square root of two plus square root of two, and this is really the key point, then I have the following, p minus v f of p plus q minus v f of q plus r minus v f of r is equal to zero when I think of p, q, uh, r, and v as complex numbers. So this is a local relation between the different f that you get only when you plug x equal one over square root of two plus square root of two. So how do you interpret this thing? Well, if you think about it and you want to define a discrete contour integral, what you would do is you would say, okay, a function defined on this mid edge is I can define the discrete contour integral, for instance, on this triangle by saying, I would say f of q times this minus this plus f of r times this minus this plus f of p times this minus this. You agree that would be the natural thing. It would be basically assuming that the function is constant on every single one of these things and just integrating. Well, this thing is saying exactly that up to a complex uh, rotation. Okay? So this thing is exactly saying that the discrete contour integral along a small triangle like that is equal to zero. But you are in a simply connected domain. If you want to define a discrete uh, contour integral, which is not just a triangle, but any path, then the, the contour integral is going to be the sum of the contour integral on triangles included in it. So if it's zero for this, it's actually zero for any discrete contour, which is a discrete analog of Morera theorem, right? So this is kind of, you can think of a function satisfying this property for every C included in omega as being kind of a discrete holomorphic function. And again, you need it to be at this x. It doesn't work at other x's. Okay? But then, that suggests very strongly that this 1 over square root 2 plus square root 2 should be 1 over mu c, because remember that when x is equal to 1 over mu c, you should have convergence to a conformally invariant object. So if you identify mu c with the square root of 2 plus square root of 2, you get your result. I, uh, and, okay, I, I'm finishing in, in one minute now. So here, I mean, what is missing is simply that a priori this is a big conjecture. There is nothing rigorous there. So here you need to find another way to justify that this is actually your, uh, it's actually one of them you see, and you have some work to do, and that's the whole story of, of, of the paper. Um, but I hope I at least gave you a, a hint of why, wh I mean, where this quote of two plus quote of two uh, emerges from. So tomorrow we will discuss uh, different things. We will discuss percolation theory. And you will see we will go back to this notion of phase transition and, uh, and some of the ideas that we develop here would be also used. Thank you very much for your attention.